Aristotle's cosmology. How is it like ours and how is it different and who cares and why does it matter? Well, like we said in part one, Aristotle's conclusions are not really accepted today. They've been disproved. But how did that happen? I'll tell you. It happened because new scientists used new data and analyzed it in much the same way Aristotle told us to. Starting by looking out the window and just looking at the world as we see it. Now we keep seeing the same things over and over. Causes and effects, they exist. Causes and effects go together, they match up or fit somehow. And effects are contingent, whereas causes are not. Or something like that. Alright, so where do we go next? But before we start, here's a fun fact. Many of the quotes in the last video came from this book, Metaphysics. Quotes from this video come mostly from the physics. Metaphysics means next to or after physics. So you see, we're going backwards. And this, I should say, barely scratches the surface of everything Aristotle did. We're not talking about his ethics or his politics. You should read his book on poetry. All we're saying is that Aristotle started with the world. And he noticed that some things are changing. Everything that changes, changes in time. Time is the key word here, so mark that. Everything that changes, changes in time. That which has changed must have been changing, and that which is changing must have changed. And a process of change is preceded by a completion of change, and a completion by a process. And we can never take any stage and say that that is absolutely the first. Yikes, okay, so we know something about change. It means moving from potential to actual. We also know that any change can be thought of as a type of movement. And we like to keep these two inside a closed shell because, like this quote said, they go together. We can never take any stage and say that it was absolutely the first. Well, we already talked about We talked about hitting the chisel. Did the matter come first or did the form? Well, in one sense, the form came first, and in another sense, the marble had to be there for in order for you to hit it. In terms of the change, though, the thing happening in time, they have to go together. Otherwise, that arrow there, it would be pointing from nowhere to nowhere, and it wouldn't be an arrow in that case. So now, pop quiz. Can change be infinite? Well, think about that. No! No, it can't. A change means moving from a potential to an actual, from point A to point B, a starting point and an end point. So a change cannot be infinitely big, but it can still be infinite, infinitely small. Let us zoom in and break that change into smaller and smaller steps. Another fun fact, this is how Aristotle solved Zeno's paradox, if you know what that is. And if you don't, that's okay, because we all agree, change is possible. Change between two endpoints. Change, which is not happening here. What's happening here? Nothing's happening. No motion. How long have they been like that? Well, I don't know. Is that a photo or a video? Well, I can't tell. They don't know what to do. Until they are pushed, they don't know if they should be falling to the right or to the left. Or maybe this is a pile of lumber. It's potentially a house. Potentially it could be a campfire. It could be either one. Potentially what will it actually become? Don't ask the wood. The wood itself doesn't know. But from now on, for the sake of sanity, we'll try to stick with physical movement or locomotion because that's kind of easier to think about. Again, Aristotle doesn't just jump to the conclusion. Everything must have a cause. Aristotle starts with things, and he notices that they either are or are not moving. And if the thing is moving, that motion came from either the thing itself or from something else. Common sense. That's our goal here. The goal also is to go from potential to actual. Or you could say the goal is to go from point A to point B. So here's a pop quiz. Could one thing move another in an infinitely long chain? A chain with no set beginning and no set ending point. And this is good news because finally we are talking about the universe as a whole. Aristotle is not, of course, working in a vacuum. That was a little joke there. Did you get that? Aristotle is working with other scientific worldviews that are floating around in his time. And there were different ones to choose from, but many had this idea of some kind of matter bouncing around and interacting with itself according to chance and according to natural laws. 
These views had no design, just chaos pushing the matter apart and some sort of coordinating force drawing it together. People thought of it in different ways. Could this kind of mosh pit go on forever? Well, that's a good question. Aristotle's answer had to do with something else common to all motion. All motion happens in time. I told you, time was the key thing in this video. Time cannot exist and is unthinkable apart from the moment. And the moment is a kind of middle point, united as it does in itself both a beginning and an end, a beginning of future time, an end of past time. Time and movement, or movement we could mean any change here, but time and movement go together. If this is movement, this is time. Time connects past and future. Elsewhere, Aristotle says time is not independent of movement and change. We apprehend time only when we have marked motion, marking it by before and after. Time is the number of movement. So time and motion go together. Remember, is that a video? Is it just a picture? Time and movement have to go together. Got it. That's Aristotle's view. Back to our question. Could this chain go on forever? Well, let's think again about causes. Maybe dominoes pushing each other. I hope you agree that if each collision in this sequence takes some time and there are infinitely many collisions, then you'll never be able to get to the first one. And if that's hard to think about, here's an example I stole from Peter Kreft. You request a book, an old book on Aristotle from your library. Well, we don't have it. That's what they, we don't have it, but we can order it for you from a consortium. We'll send you an email. Okay, that's great. You get the email from the consortium. Well, they don't have the book either, but they can request it from a university in Europe. And then that university doesn't have it either, but they can request it from another university. And you start to scratch your head and you wonder, Will this thing go on forever? But then you get your answer because you get the book in the mail and it's got lots of different postage stickers on it. And you're not sure how long that chain ultimately was, but you know, what, you know one thing. It wasn't infinite because you have the book. And the book had to come from somewhere. Okay, an infinitely long chain of dominoes will not work. But what if all the motion happens simultaneously? Is that possible? Think of gears. An infinite line of gears, all moving at once. Again, not unlike the mosh pit, with everyone bumping into everyone else all the time, or an ideal guess. Is Aristotle okay with that? No! No infinite mosh pits! But why? Since the motion of A, call that center gear there, call that gear A. Since the motion of A and that of each of the others are simultaneous, the whole motion must occupy the same time as the motion of A. But the time occupied by the motion of A is finite. Consequently, the motion will be infinite in a finite time, which is impossible. You cannot have infinite motion in a finite time. That's what Aristotle says. Again, you cannot have infinite motion in a finite time. But why? Because, again, time and movement, time and motion go together. They really do go together. You have to believe that. Do you see it? Well, maybe not. And you're thinking to yourself, well, listen, I'm an open-minded person. I could see this thing work, and I could see it happening. That gear in the center is turning a bit, and all the other ones are turning too, and I'm okay with that. But, but that is uniform motion. We're trying to talk about change here. Could you grab gear A as it's moving and switch it around to move the other way? Could you? Uh, you're not so sure now, are you? Think of it this way. Changes in the motion of gear A, would have that information would have to be sent out infinitely far to the right and infinitely far to the left. And that, that message would have to get to infinitely far away instantaneously. Could that happen? Again, the claim here, Aristotle's claim, is that you cannot have infinite motion or infinite change in a finite time meaning that the gears, like the dominoes, can't go on forever. And you probably see where we're going with this, the unmoved first mover. If everything that is in motion must be moved by something, either by something else or moved by itself, so if everything in motion has to be moved by something, and in the former case, the one where you're moved by something else, there must be a first mover that is not moved by anything else, that is moved by itself the unmoved first mover. So that means Aristotle's universe had a beginning, right? 
not so fast. Remember where we started. Causes and effects exist. They go together. And you cannot get an infinite effect from a finite cause. We're having fun with that third common sense idea there. And according to Aristotle, time and motion are friends, really good friends. So, it follows that there must always be time, since the moment is both a beginning and an end. There must always be time on both sides of it. But if this is true of time, it is evident that it must also be true of motion, time being a kind of affection of motion. Common sense. If you had no marble slab, you could never have a statue. Take away the potential, and you take away the actual as well as the change. You could never hit anything if you didn't have a marble slab. Take away the before, and you take away the after, as well as taking away the time. That arrow can't just point from nowhere to nowhere. If it did, it's not an arrow. And again, this is a result. Time was the key thing. This is a result of time and change having that affection for one another. Time can never have a beginning or an end. Q-E-D. But wait, is that just a result of how you defined time? Yes, yes it is. And that's my whole point here. And that's what errors, definitions matter. That's the point. Anyway, right now this sounds a little weird because we have a first mover, so we have a first in an infinitely old universe. Time and motion are eternal, but still something was first. A unmoved mover was first. So let's take a look at this. Let's uh, back up to the first, no, no, back up to the second motion. Here we are at the beginning, kind of, of the universe, but it doesn't, you say, I can't say that. I said the universe had a beginning. The universe doesn't have a beginning. This is, the first mover is about to do something here, about to move something else. But notice who else is here. That first mover is the only one moving right now, you could say, but he, she, it is not alone. There's also all this potential. Nothing but potential. All this prime matter, Aristotle calls it prime matter. You could think of these as dominoes or as gears if you want to, but we have an infinite universe, an eternal, infinitely old universe. Wait, did I say infinite? Is this universe infinitely big? That's our final pop quiz question. What do you think? Every body is necessarily to be classed either as simple or composite. The infinite body, therefore, will be either simple or composite. But it is clear further that if the simple bodies are finite, the composite must also be finite, since that which is composed of bodies finite both in number and in magnitude. And it took a while, but we were able to show that. We were able to prove that the bodies, the dominoes or gears, are finite in number. And if the composite is made up of finite numbers of finite things, the, the composite is also finite. Anyway, what remains for us to consider then is whether any of the simple bodies can be infinite in magnitude. Good question. Let us try the primary body first. We're zeroing in on you, you unmoved first mover, you uncaused first cause. Let us consider, and oh, you have to be a sphere. You should be a sphere. Aristotle said that, quote, only circular movements can be continuous and infinite. Because, well, let's just take his word on that one. I don't feel like going into that. Could this first mover be infinitely big? Could the universe be? No, because an infinitely big sphere can't be in motion. It cannot rotate. Oh, uh, think about that one. How, how about this question? How long, how much time would it take for an infinitely big sphere to rotate around itself once? But common sense also. It's common sense Aristotle. He goes outside, he looks up, and he notices the heavenly celestial sphere is moving. A finite universe. Again, that might not be our current understanding, depending on when you're listening to this, but it's not a bad place to live. It's a place where reason and nature are friends.